God in the womb has all of your deeds written out. Not that he controls your life, but he had a plan made for your life. Your gender, the time that you were born, the color of your skin, all of your gifts and talents, everything about you is geared to fulfill a purpose. God made you for a purpose. And I used a number of scriptures last night to make that point. And when you start talking like that, that raises questions about, well, man, I know I didn't follow God for a while and that I've messed up what God's plan for my life was. And so some people panic like, well, man, I've blown it. And then they get into condemnation. Well, I use this morning uh, the scriptures about Saul and David to show that Saul was God's first choice. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13 says, If Saul, Saul would have obeyed God in that instance, then he would, God would have established his kingdom over Israel forever. So God chose Saul first. David wasn't God's first choice. And yet look how wonderful things worked out with David. God's plan B is better than most of our plan A's. And then I took David and showed how that David sinned with Bathsheba, and that never was God's will. And yet, after David and Bathsheba repented, God blessed that union and called their son that was born his name. David called him Solomon, but God called him Jedidiah, beloved of God. And God blessed that union that started in adultery. And God blessed it. And Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs and wrote about his virtuous mother, Bathsheba, the virtuous woman of Proverbs chapter 31. And God can redeem whatever situation you're in. So you need that encouragement of this morning to go along with the aggravation that I gave you last night. Amen. <laughs> and tonight, let's turn over to the book of Romans chapter 12. And tonight what I want to do is share with you the scriptures that God used to change my life. These are the very first verses that ever became alive to me, that God just spoke them into my heart. And I mentioned this briefly last night, but let me just go back over this, that as I approached graduating from high school, I became aware that God had a purpose for my life. I've always believed that, and I just didn't know what it was. And until I was through with high school, I didn't really have to think about it. But as I approached graduation... I knew I was going to have to make some decisions about what I was going to do. So for about 18 months, I started seeking God. Nobody could tell me how to find God's will, so I just prayed and studied the Bible. I read the Bible through multiple times. And I was preparing the ground. And that's an important point there that I can't overemphasize. It's not that God doesn't want to show you His will, but God doesn't want to speak to you and show you His purposes for your life until you're ready to receive it. There are some of you right now that if God was to speak to you with your heart in the condition that it's in, you would think, that's the devil. And you'd wind up rebuking God because you'd say, oh no, that couldn't be me. I'd never do that. And you would wind up resisting God. Or... If God showed you exactly what He had for you right now, some of you would become so impatient, you would become so dissatisfied with where you are that you wouldn't take the steps that it takes to get into the will of God. You would just want to do it all right now. Impatience is a disease that seems to affect most people, and we just want it right now. We want it immediately. So... God can't always show you everything. He will start pointing you in a direction and moving you, but He can't show you everything all at once because you aren't to a place yet to where you would embrace what He had to say. Many of you would be terrified by it. Many of you would say, that's the devil, and rebuke it, or others would sit there and become so impatient, you'd never stay the course until God worked in you and got the things ready for you to receive it. So, it's not that God is hesitant to show you, but sometimes it takes God working on you and doing some things in your life before you can receive God's will. So, in my case, I started seeking the Lord, and there was about 18 months that I sought God with my whole heart, and I just became dominated and controlled with, what is your will for my life? What do you want me to do? And every waking moment was focused on that. And finally, uh, this was in Christmas of 1967, right after I had graduated from high school. I was in my first year of college. And uh, at 
Christmas time, there was a group of us that went up to a place in New Mexico to go skiing and tubing and things like this. And we had a speaker that came in at night and spoke about the Lord and, and did devotional things. And anyway, this guy read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And when he read this, it's just like those words jumped off the page because it says you do these things and you will prove the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And he gave a dictionary definition of the word prove. It means to make manifest to your physical senses what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And this is what I'd been seeking. God, what do you want for my life? And all of a sudden, it just jumped off the page that you do these things and you will make manifest to the physical senses. See, I knew that God had a purpose for me. I just didn't have it manifest to my physical senses. I hadn't had it proven to me yet, but I knew that God had a purpose for my life just like he did for you. And so when the man read this, he was actually making another point. This wasn't the focus of what he was doing, but when he read these verses, it's the first time that a scripture just leapt off the page and I knew that God was saying, right here's your answer. And so from Christmas of 1967 until March the 23rd of 1968, about four months, I studied this verse and prayed about it and read and said, God, what does this mean? And this literally changed my life. This led to an experience on March the 23rd where God touched my life and for four and a half months I was caught up in the presence of God. And I've never been the same since and I'm never going to be the same. It totally transformed my life. And you know what? All of it started with wanting to know what God's will was. Then it led me to these verses and the revelation of what these verses meant led to that experience that absolutely changed my life. So here's what I want to share with you. And there's a lot of things that the Lord told me. I'm going to try and distill this down. And I encourage you to study this because there's more in this than what I'm going to be able to share with you. But these are just some of the highlights. I had wanted to know, God, what's your vocation? What do you want me to do? I was thinking about going to school and taking a course. And what do you want me to dedicate my life to as far as vocation? Here's one of the things that God spoke to me out of this. That God's will isn't for me to be a minister. God's will is for me to be a living sacrifice. And then once he gets me as a living sacrifice, how he uses me is secondary. It's incidental. There are some of you that are saying, all right, what does God want me to do? Am I supposed to be a, a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, a, you know, whatever, and you're praying about what your vocation is? Let me put it to you this way. The Lord doesn't want your service as much as He wants you. The Lord loves you more than He loves what you can do for Him. Now that's an important point to make because in our day and age, especially in the church that I grew up in, it was all about service. You got to do something for God. We used to sing this song about my... I was born to serve the Lord. My eyes were made to read His Word. My ears were made to hear His Word. My feet were made to walk in His path. I was born to serve the Lord. And you know, there is a partial truth to that, that yes, we were created for His pleasure and for His glory, but it left me with the message that God was concerned about my service more than He was about me. And so I was always, oh, I've got to do a work for God. I've got to do something. I became a human doing instead of a human being. It was all about I've got to do a work. I've got to do something. And it, I related God's acceptance of me and His love for me to my performance. And I had to be doing something. And therefore, if I wasn't out on a mission field or if I wasn't doing something awesome, then God wasn't pleased with me because it was all about what I did. This is saying that God's will is for you to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him. This is your reasonable service. One of the translations says it's your normal Christian duty. 
This isn't just for the preachers. This isn't just for people that have devoted themselves full time to the Lord. If you've been born again, Jesus died for you and the very least you can do is live for Him. The Lord gave Himself so that He could have you, not just your service. And this is one of the things that the Lord spoke to me. He says, you're wrong asking about, do I want you to do this and that? At the time, I didn't even think about being a preacher. And I was saying about my, everybody in my family has been a school teacher. And I was asking, do you want me to be a school teacher? Do you want me to do this or that? And he says, you're missing it. He says, I want you. And if I get you, then I'll be able to use you however I want to. And here's one of the things that the Lord spoke to me. I was praying, oh God, use me. Oh God, use me. Show me what you want me to do. God, do you want me to do this and this? And the Lord spoke to me and he says... The reason I haven't used you is because you aren't usable. He says, quit praying that I'll use you and instead pray, God, make me usable. It changed my life. This radically changed my life. During those four months period of time, I quit praying, oh God, show me what you want to do and oh God, use me. And I started saying, Lord, here am I. Make me usable. And you know what? God wants to use you more than you want to be used. And if you would make yourself a living sacrifice and commit your life to the Lord, I guarantee you God would start molding you and taking you and developing your talents and gifts and, and uh, directing you. And, and as soon as you got usable, God will use you. God wants to use you more than you want to be used. There is so much that the Lord needs people. He says that the harvest is ripe and plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers. God is looking for people that he can use, but the problem is most of us aren't usable. Look at this passage. Keep, you know, I'm going to come back to Romans chapter 12, but look over here in John chapter 2. This is the very first time that Jesus was in the city of Jerusalem after his baptism by John and he had started his public ministry and in John chapter 2, it says in verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. It doesn't give us all of these miracles right here, but you know John is the one who wrote over in I think the 21st chapter that this is only a small portion of what Jesus did. If everything that Jesus did was written down, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the volumes that should be written. Man, Jesus was awesome. And we only have a small listing of things. It didn't tell you what these miracles were, but when they saw the miracles that he did, it said many believed on his name. Let me ask you what we would do today. Let's say, for instance, I just came to Orlando and I... I walked in here and all of a sudden we saw people raised from the dead. and blind. We've seen miracles happen, but you know, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of people that just will discount them and stuff. But if we saw the dead raised and blind eyes open and awesome things happen, and if all of a sudden there was 10,000 people that were coming and they were just wanting to get hold of this truth, you know what the average preacher would do? Mobilize them. Put a track in their hand. Have them go out and start telling people. Call the television stations. Advertise. Capitalize on this. Take advantage of it. Here was a multitude of people that was willing to acknowledge that Jesus was the Christ. And how did Jesus respond? It says, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any man should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus didn't want these people talking about him because he knew that they weren't ready. For one thing, they weren't born again. They weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. Even his disciples, after they had spent three and a half years with him and saw him resurrected from the dead, the last thing he told them is, don't go tell anybody I'm resurrected from the dead until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit and then you'll be empowered to be my witnesses. Jesus is more concerned about the quality of of ministry than he is the quantity of ministry. We're just about the opposite. Today, if a person gets born again, we just pat them on the back, go out and tell everybody. 
You need to be prepared. You need to get to where you aren't ministering out of your own ability, but that you are ministering from the power and the anointing of God, and it just takes a while for that to happen. Jesus wouldn't commit himself to these people because he didn't want people speaking out of their own ability. The majority of people today that are representing God are speaking out of something they heard somebody else say. Their heart may be good, they may mean good, but it's just men speaking. It's not the power of the Holy Spirit, and it causes problems. Thank you for that thunderous silence. I know that this is a new wrinkle in a lot of your brains, and you're just thinking, oh, this can't be, but I'm reading Scripture to you. Jesus, there was a multitude that believed on him, and he would not commit himself to them because he didn't want them talking out of just natural human ability. He wanted them to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And this goes right along with, with Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that God wants you before he wants your service. And if he doesn't have you, if he doesn't have your heart then why would he want to reveal his purpose to you so that you could go out and in your own human ability try and do it and just mess everything up? He loves you too much for that. You know, the Lord is concerned about the witness that it presents, yes, but he also loves you. He, do he doesn't want you to step out and start fulfilling his will. And some of you, this will be news to you also, but if you find God's will for your life, there are some wonderful things that go along with it. I was talking last night about a satisfaction, a peace, a joy that you can't know if you don't find God's will. But at the same time, when you find God's will and you are walking in the center of God's will, you just had a huge target drawn on you. Satan is going to come to steal, kill, and to destroy and Satan fights against you, and you are going to have opposition. There is going to be problems. And if God hasn't got your heart and able to mold it so that he can meet your needs and give you faith to be able to overcome the wiles of the devil and the darts that come against you, it would destroy you to find God's will and get out there in your own strength and power and do it. Satan would make sure that he comes against you. You know... Man, I got so much to say. It's hard for, I'm thinking, I'm thinking 20 minutes down the road, things I need to say. But you know, some of you, the reason you haven't bumped into the devil is because you're both going the same direction. Some of you, the reason that you haven't had any great problems is because you aren't a threat. And, and here's another thing about Satan that a lot of people don't understand. As far as we know, demons don't procreate. Demons don't have baby demons. Demons aren't reproducing as far as I can tell in Scripture. So either there was a bunch of demons per person back in Adam and Eve's day, or there's a shortage of demons now. Personally, I believe there is a shortage of demons. And I believe Satan is shorthanded. And I don't believe every person has their personal demon that we claim. I think with many of us, Satan has just taught you wrong things. And you're doing a wonderful job of messing your life up. And he, he can leave you alone. Amen. You're just doing a bang-up job. Matter of fact, I think the devil sometimes sits down and takes notes and thought, Oh, I never thought of that one. Amen. Some of you have probably inspired the devil. So my point is that you know what? I don't think that every single person has a personal devil that is doing all of these things. He's shorthanded. But when you find God's will and you get on target and all of a sudden the anointing of God is flowing through you and people's lives are being impacted by you, I can guarantee you, you are going to have some demonic activity. Satan will come against you. Jesus said, beware if all men speak well against you. It says in the book of Proverbs that the adulteress will seek after the precious life, inspired by the devil to come against the precious life. And Satan puts a priority on people that are in the center of God's will and making an impact and causing his kingdom damage. It's the same thing as if you were in a battle and if you all of a sudden were attacked on one flank and if they were making inroads, you would come back and attack them back and try and close that gap. Satan leaves some people alone because he doesn't have to do anything to you. You are doing a bang-up job of destroying your own life. 
But when you start fulfilling God's will, there's going to be opposition, and the Lord knows that. And if your heart isn't really yielded to the Lord, and if you haven't let God flow on the inside of you, God loves you too much to reveal His will to you and put you on the front lines when you are not prepared to be able to meet the challenge. I don't know if you get that, but that is a major truth. One of the reasons that God hasn't revealed His will to some of you is because He loves you so much that He doesn't want you to find out what His will is. Get out there and try and do it in your flesh and unable to deal with the opposition and the criticism that comes. He doesn't want to destroy you. He loves you more than He loves what you could do for Him. He's not willing to sacrifice you. You know, there's a lot of people that I honestly see it like God is just wanting to use people like you stick a straw in a soda cup and you just suck it until you hear the... and then God throws it away and goes and gets another one. And that's the way that some people think that God is. He's just going to use you up and take whatever good He can and, and His kingdom is all important. God loves you more than He loves what you can do for Him. And one reason God hasn't revealed Himself to some of you is because you aren't able... You know, in my own personal life, there have been times that I've had opportunities where I kind of could have kicked the door open. I could have made some things happen. But by the grace of God, I didn't do it. I had some men come to me one time that had written a letter. I won't tell you who this is for. It's a person that all of you know. And they had written a letter for him and raised $22 million dollars. And they came to me. And, of course, my ministry was a lot smaller. And they said, we can guarantee you one to two million dollars. And, boy, back then when my income was like $40,000 a month. And I could have used one or two million dollars. And so I said, well, come. And they all came and they showed me the letter that they wrote for this other guy. They gave me a sample letter of how they could raise one to two million dollars from my mailing list. And I looked at it and I said, but these things aren't true. I don't have these problems. They had pictures of babies with swollen bellies and things that they were doing. And I said, I don't have an orphanage and I don't do this. And they said, well, this other guy didn't have this stuff either, but we raised $22 million from him. And you know what? I, I was tempted because I wanted the, the money to be able to do things. But I finally, I had paid these guys airfare to come in from California and Dallas and Oklahoma and different places and I said, you know what? Take my money. You take your stuff. And I said, get out of here. I said, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to do this. And the money that I paid them is money that I could have used. But I just said, you know, it's more important to me how I get there than it is whether or not I arrive. And I said, if I never reach the goals and do the things that God told me, I'm not going to lie to the people and tell them something that isn't true. And so I kicked them out. But you know what? There was opportunities to compromise, and I've seen other people who circumvented God's system of doing things and got out, and they rode on somebody's coattail, they knocked the door down. You can, you can uh, in a ministry situation, you can do things outside of God being the one that promotes you. Some of you don't understand that, but it's absolutely true. Not every big church is God made it big. Matter of fact, some of the very biggest churches today are the churches that have compromised the Word. They have turned into little sermonettes where it's more entertainment and they've made it convenient for people and there's no commitment. There's, it doesn't cost you anything. And uh, the very largest churches in America today are not the best churches. I go to a church that has 12,000 people and I just recently met with the pastor and he was asking me about some things, and I said, look, I'm not sure you want to ask me about this. And, and he says, no, I want your opinion. And I said, if you gave me your church for a month, I could whittle it down to a thousand people. And I said, if you gave it to me for two or three months, I'd have it down to about 500. You probably have 500 people in this 12,000 member church that are committed. I said, not even half of them are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he agreed. And so, anyway, my point is, see, that there are people that you can build a big church with flashy names and, and smoke and mirrors and, 
and all of the right things and the things that will tickle people's ear. And you can build a big church without doing it God's way. And there's ways that I could have gotten on television sooner and I could have done other things. But you know what? By the grace of God, we have done it God's way. We've been latecomers. It's taken me 41 years to bloom. But you know what? What we've got, we didn't push or pull. We didn't lie. We didn't manipulate. We haven't forced a person. We give our materials away. And did you know that what we have today, I didn't make it happen, and I don't have to do something to keep it happening. But my point is that during this period of time, you know what? God was working in Jamie and me and dealing with us. There was a time that I remember we wrote out a covenant one time for $700 a month. If we could get $700 a month, we could pay all of our ministry bills, our salary, and an employee and give $200 a month. And we wrote that covenant out thinking, man, we would be in tall cotton if we ever got $700. And we'd struggle. It took us a year before we got up to where we were getting $700 a month. And we struggled. But, you know, we've, we've gone through these things. And what it does, during that period of time, our faith is developed. And we got the $700 faith. And then $1,000. And then $10,000. And now I'm up to a place where $2 million a month is no problem. I don't lose any sleep over it. I don't ever think about it. But you know what? I wasn't there 40 years ago. And if God would have shown me and tried to get me to do what I'm doing right now that costs $2 million a month back when I was at $700 a month, it would have overwhelmed me. It would have terrified me. And so God had to work in my heart and increase me before He could reveal some of these things to me. And some of you are in that exact situation. You're saying, why isn't God showing me? these things because you couldn't handle it. It would overwhelm you. You'd die of a heart attack. God, I can't do this. Who do you think I am? You haven't seen yourself the way that God sees you. And you know what? God has to work on you. So here's the way that God reveals His will to you. God's will for every person in here. I can tell you exactly what God's will is. It's for you to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto Him. And until you get that fulfilled, which will take you the rest of your life, <laughs> then don't even worry about, well, what do you want me to do? You become a living sacrifice. You die to yourself and to your own selfish ambitions. And you say, Father, no longer am I trying to get you to bless this. And, oh, God, open up this door and help me to accomplish this. And, oh, God, help me to do this. Instead, you just say, Father, here am I. I'm a living sacrifice. You know what a sacrifice is? It's something you place on the altar and it's not giving instructions about what you want the person that's sacrificing it to do. You're just there at the mercy of that person. They can do anything they want to with you. They're going to kill you. And you just die to yourself. You die to your own selfish ambitions. And you say, Father, whatever you want, that's what I'm going to do. And you know what? This isn't normal. This isn't natural. This is not the way that fallen human beings are. In case you haven't noticed, when you have a little baby, that sweet little baby doesn't give a rip about anybody but themselves. <laughs> they will wake you up in the middle of the night. They forget the fact that the mama has gone through labor and been up all night long, they'll wake everybody up when they want something and they don't care. If you had a little baby in this auditorium, we've got a thousand people or something in here, and you know what? A little baby wouldn't care about anybody, about whether they're hearing the word about it. It doesn't know that another person exists. A baby is absolutely 100% selfish and self-centered and thinks that they are the center of the universe and every one of us came into the world exactly that way. And sad to say, a majority of us are still <laughs> that way. No longer do you fall on the floor and suck your thumb or throw a fit, but you know what? You'll just sit there and turn that cold shoulder that'll cause icicles to form on your mate. <laughs> you have different ways of being self-centered and thinking about things, but you know what? The natural human tendency of a fallen person is to think that it's all about you. And that 
is Satan's beachhead in your life. That's his landing zone. That's how he gains access to you. Did you know Satan's temptation against Adam and Eve was, I'm rephrasing it, but it was basically God isn't thinking about you. God is keeping something from you. You could be more like God. Think about yourself. Here was God who created this perfect world. Wouldn't it have been awesome to be in paradise with Adam and Eve? You know, the world was perfect. There was not such a thing as a storm. It never rained. There was just a mist that came up and watered the ground. It never rained. There wasn't such a thing as a storm. There wasn't bad weather. There was never a hurricane. There was never a tornado. Everything was perfect. Everything grew perfectly. The, per the perfect climate. Everything was perfect. God had treated them good. There wasn't a single reason for them to be upset with him. But Satan got them to thinking, you aren't being taken care of. He's holding something back from you. And you can phrase it differently, but basically their temptation was selfishness to think about themselves and to reject the God who had been perfect to them, who had treated them wonderfully, who meant with them every day in the cool of the evening. I mean, God had a universe to run. And yet, God Almighty came and talked with them every day. He had given them honor and respect and been good to them, and yet they thought, it's not enough. I need more. Just like a little kid. You spend $200 on a Christmas present, and they open it and play with it for a minute and throw it down. Is that all I got? That's the way that all of us were. Absolutely selfish. That's the way you started. And you know what? Most people are still absolutely selfish. And if God was to reveal His will to you with that, the very first time a person comes and says something about you, you would be so self-centered, so hurt that you couldn't handle it. You'd be thinking about, why are they saying this about me? You know, this will, I could get way off the subject and teach on a... Different, I've got a book out there entitled Self-Centeredness, The Root of All Grief. You ought to get that. That is one of the most awesome teachings in the world. You need that. If you're breathing, you got a self. You need that. Every person needs that. But you know, it's only your selfishness that makes you so in tune with what everybody's doing to hurt you. Those of you who talk about, oh, that you don't know what's happened to me and all of this, it's because you're so selfish that you're so hurt. And I know that that really rubs some of you the wrong way. And some of you take offense at that. But the scripture says we're supposed to die to ourselves. And if you had a corpse down here in front of me in a casket, I could spit on that corpse. I could insult the corpse. I could kick the corpse. I could ignore the corpse. And if it's a corpse, it's not going to respond. You know why you've responded so much to what's been done to you? Because you aren't a corpse. Because you are very much in love with yourself. Self is sitting on the throne of your life. And you know, I can say this with some degree of conviction because, man, I got a lot of people that dislike me. I got blogs that are written about me and people that do things and people just think that they are God-ordained to tell everybody that I'm of the devil. And I have a lot of things happen. And you know what? I can tell you that... If it was just me, selfish, I would get in and try and defend myself. But the Lord gave me a prophecy in the very beginning, when I was still in the Baptist church, and because of my stand on the Word and the things I was saying, I was getting persecuted and criticized. I'd been voted out of one church and threatened to be voted out of another church, and things were happening. And I went to a meeting, and a friend of mine, Joe Nade, called me out, and he, he gave me a prophecy, and he says, Andrew, I see you like a runner on a track. And he says, you are running good. You're leading the race. But all of the people in the grandstands are telling you you're doing it all wrong. And he says, I see you getting off of the track and running up into the grandstands and arguing with the spectators. And he says, even if you win the argument, you're going to lose the race. Forget what people say about you. He says, stay on track. Stay on track. And God used that to speak to me. And I can tell you that I have made this just a habit of mine. I don't do it perfectly, but to the best I can, I just try and ignore what you have to say. <laughs> I don't like it when people dislike me. I've had people come up and spit in my face. 
I've had people do all kinds of things to me. I don't like it. It doesn't give me warm fuzzies, but you know what? It's not going to make me quit doing what I'm doing. I'm going to stay on track. And you aren't as important to me as God. And you know why that happened? Because God revealed to me, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and for about four months I thought, God, I want to be a living sacrifice. I don't even know how to be a living sacrifice. I don't even know where the altar is. But God, I want to be a living sacrifice so that I could prove the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And for four months, I prayed and said, God, help me to be a living sacrifice. And then, on March the 23rd, 1968, we had a prayer meeting every Saturday night. This will give you an indication of how religious I was. On Saturday night, an, an 18-year-old boy, I mean, for a year or two, we met together every Saturday night from 10 o'clock until 11 o'clock and prayed. And that's what all of my friends did. We got together and just prayed. And we were in this prayer meeting and the guy who was the youth director of our church, uh, we were sitting around kind of just joking around and kidding around, talking about whatever. And this guy, when he talked to the Lord, he talked like there was actually somebody there. Like he was carrying on a conversation. He would pray and then he'd stop and God would speak to him. And he'll say, yes, I'll do that. And he'd pray and it was like a two-way conversation. When I prayed, it was like, oh, God, forgive us of all of our sins. Send revival. Help us to do this. And it was a monologue. And then at the end, I'd tack on in the name of Jesus. Amen. And my prayer was really puny compared to his prayer. So every time we got together to pray, I would pray first and get my prayer out of the way because after Marion prayed, there was nothing left to say. He prayed for the whole world. He'd pray for 20 minutes. <laughs> and so anyway, we were standing around still talking and Marion just hit his knees on the floor in the pastor's study and started praying and just crying out to God and talking. And the guy prayed for 45 minutes. And during his prayer, I was kneeling down over there and instead of enjoying his prayer or communing with God, I was thinking, how rude. <laughs> he just came in. He's pray Now, what am I going to pray? What is everybody going to think about me? I said, there's nothing left to say after Marion gets through. And I said, everybody's going to think I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just carnal and that I don't love God. What's everybody going to think about me? And it was all self. And I was thinking about myself, and I don't know how this happened, but I'd been praying, God, help me to be a living sacrifice. And it was supernatural. It's just like somebody pulled a curtain back. I don't have any explanation for this. But all of a sudden, I saw what an absolute hypocrite I was and how self-centered my whole life was and everything I had done. I was leading two and three people a week to the Lord when I was 13, 14, 15 years old. I started a special youth visitation. I went to the adult visitation. I witnessed. I did everything. I mean, you know, I, I lived at church. I was seeking God with everything I knew, but the Lord showed me that I was doing it all for myself and for that little pat on the back and the fact that they'd have me come up in front of church every Sunday and say, how many people have you led to the Lord? And I'd say two or three, and I'd bring their scalps back to church with me <laughs> so that everybody could see what I had done. And God just showed me that I was an absolute hypocrite and that I hadn't done a single thing with a pure motive. And that I had never prayed because I loved God. I prayed so that I could win awards. I had awards. I had attendance awards, daily Bible reading awards. I won all of the sword drills. Many don't even know what that is. I'd, I could do anything and everything in the church. And I had a lot of, of pride in all of the things that I had done. And God just pulled back a curtain and showed me that my heart was wrong that I was selfish. I hadn't done any of it with a pure motive. And you know, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says that when we stand before Him, that we're going to have all of these works. Some are going to have works piled up that are wood, hay, and stubble. Others will have works that are piled, piled up that are precious stones and gold and silver. But God is going to set a match to it. And all of the things that you've done in the flesh and for yourself 
are going to be burned and it's only what's left. I believe that there are some of us that by the time God gets through putting a torch to our works, we're going to basically be standing there with just a pile of ashes at our feet. And this is where I was. I was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was the most religious kid in our deal that I knew of. And God just showed me I was an absolute hypocrite. God showed me all of these things. And you know, the surprising thing was that instead of me being hurt or offended, I saw, it was the first time I'd ever seen it. And man, I, after Marion got through praying in front of all of my friends, all of the leaders of the church, I turned myself inside out and I confessed not only things that I'd done, but my motives, my actions, how I thought about people, how I'd criticized them. I just turned myself inside out and confessed things that I didn't even know were wrong until God showed this to me. And man, I just literally laid myself on the altar and, and repented and said, God, I am sorry. And some of you will have a hard time believing this, but at that time I was in the Baptist church and I was told that God is the one that killed my dad when I was 12 years old. God is the one that killed my grandmother who basically raised me until the time I was 8 years old. God's the one that did all of these terrible things and God judged you and God was angry. And when I saw all of this sin and how that everything I had done was wrong, I believed God was going to kill me. I thought that when God showed me how how much of a hypocrite I was, I thought that that was the first time God had seen it. <laughs> and I just was certain He was going to kill me. And some of you think that's an exaggeration, but I expected God to kill me. I honestly did. When I saw how vile I was. And you know, there's some of you that have gone out and committed adultery and you've murdered or done whatever. And I was Mr. Righteous. I've never said a word of profanity in my 60 years. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never tasted coffee. Some of you think coffee is... <laughs> I'm not putting coffee and booze in the same category. You've got a scripture to stand on for drinking coffee. It says Mark 16, 17, You can drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm you. Amen. <laughs> I'm just saying I lived a separated, holy life and yet, I did it for all of the wrong reasons. And the motive behind your action is more important than your action. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, if you give all of your goods to feed the poor or if you give your body to be burned and don't do it motivated by love, it profits you nothing. I was doing all of the right things for the wrong reasons. I was an absolute hypocrite and I didn't even realize it. And I started confessing this and turned myself inside out and I just ruined my reputation. Those people that heard me say things. I was saying things that nobody would ever like me again if they heard all of the stuff that I had thought and all of the lust that was in my heart and the hate that was in my heart and the way I thought of other people. I ruined my reputation in front of my best friends, in front of all the leaders of the church, but I thought God was about to kill me and I was just going to confess everything I could think of so that if He killed me, at least I'd go to heaven. And I prayed for like an hour and 45 minutes. Probably the first time in my life I'd ever prayed more than 15 minutes. I prayed for an hour and 45 minutes. I cried. I confessed everything I could. And you know what I did? I made myself a living sacrifice. I humbled myself. And I admitted that God was righteous and that I was unrighteous. And I was expecting God to kill me, but here's what changed my life. When I did that and... I could spend hours talking about this. But you know what? Some people say, well, I'm not sure if I've ever really made a total commitment of my life to the Lord. Well, then you haven't. Because you know what? When you make a total commitment of your life to the Lord, you know it. There was nothing else for me to give. Now, I didn't know every temptation or thought that would ever come to me in my life, but I, I made a total commitment of my life to the Lord. I sold out. There wasn't a thing left. And I got through after like an hour and 45 minutes. There was nothing left to say. There wasn't anything to give. You know, prior to this time, every time we had a church service, I would rededicate my life. That's what you did in the Baptist church. You couldn't get baptized in the Holy Spirit or change or anything. So once you got born again, all you could do is rededicate. 
If I'd have had a rededicator, I'd have broken mine because I rededicated myself every time that we had a service. I was always knowing that something could have been done better and I'd go down and rededicate myself. Did you know after this, I got up the next day and I stood in front of our Baptist church and I said, I'll never rededicate my life again. And some people took that wrong and misunderstood it. But I knew that there was nothing that I didn't give God. There was, no, there was nothing I didn't put on the table. And I had literally just everything. And there was nothing left to give. I was wrung out. There was nothing left to confess. And I was waiting on God to kill me. And what changed my life was that instead of wrath and rejection... I had a tangible love of God come over me and for four and a half months, I was gone someplace. I don't know what happened. I never slept more than an hour at a time for over four months. I never sat down and ate a meal. I'm, I ate, but I just eat enough to keep me going. I remember being so sleepy that one time I was walking out the door and I just thought I'm going to rest for just a second and I leaned against the door casing and fell asleep for about an hour standing up. But I couldn't sleep when God loves you. Man, I was excited. I couldn't sit down and eat when you could sit there and read the Bible. I'd go get something and go back into my room and sit there and read the Bible and stuff. And I mean, it just transformed my life. Instead of the rejection and the punishment that I thought was coming, God showed me He loved me and I knew that it had Zippo to do with me because for the first time in my life I'd seen that I was a zero with the rim knocked off, that I was absolutely nothing. And it was when I was at my worst that I found God's love and I realized that God's love was absolutely according to grace. It had nothing to do with my goodness or badness, that God just loved me. And I tell you what, it transformed my life. It totally changed me. And you know what? Not everybody's going to have maybe an emotional or a, some kind of a dramatic encounter the way that I did, but everybody needs to have this same thing happen. To where you quit sitting on the throne of your life and running your life and choosing what you will do and what you won't do. And God, if you called me to do this and this and this, I'll do that, but don't ask me to do this. You know what? You aren't a living sacrifice. If you're a sacrifice, then you don't have any control. You are at the mercy of the one who is sacrificing you. And this is really what God is out to do. And until you reach this place, God can't reveal His perfect will. Or He certainly can't re reveal the depths of it or the totality of it because you'd go out and try and accomplish it in your own strength and power and mess the whole thing up. You would have a target drawn on you. Satan would kill you along the way. You'd never make it. And God loves you more than that. God wants you more than He wants your service. And if He got your heart and if you just ran up the white flag and surrendered and said, God, I'm yours. Anything you want. I'll give you anything and everything I've got. If you would absolutely commit yourself to God, I guarantee you God's plan for you is better than your plan for yourself. And it would take a period of time for you to be able to learn it, for God to work the things in you. But I guarantee you God would start you on the most adventurous life you could ever dream. It would be better than you could ever plan for yourself. And it solves a lot of problems. A lot of problems. You know, since I made that decision, you have to keep making it. It's not just a one-time deal. It's a one-time thing when you begin the process. But God can't deal with all of your flesh instantly. I've, had, I've preached this message before and I've had people come up and say, just pray for me that I'll just die right here and that I'll never have another problem with this flesh again. I mean, the only way that's going to happen is for you to physically die. Because as long as you're breathing, you've got a self and it is going to seek to reassert itself. And I haven't always been perfect. Now, I hadn't always just loved God and not been selfish. But you know what? I made a commitment with all of my heart. And as soon as I see my selfishness and as soon as I see this happening, I have never had to rededicate myself. I've had to say, whoops, 
there's that self coming back up again. And I've had to say, Father, I'm not going that way. Thank you for showing me. And I get back on track. But I've never lost my commitment. I committed myself to God 41, nearly 42 years ago next month. And I have never been uncommitted. I haven't lived up to it. I've fallen and failed. But I've never had to start over again. I don't know if you understand that because this is different than most people's lives. Most people just commit a little bit and then they wind up doing something that is an absolute rebellion and they, they don't care and they go their own way and then they have to come back and recommit and they're up and down like a yo-yo. I'm telling you, you can reach a place to where you just literally turn it all over to God and that, that's all there is to it. And if God told you to do anything, you do it. And it's not up for negotiation. When the Lord called us to go to Pritchett, Colorado, Pritchett, Colorado is like the end of the world. It's so close you can see the edge of the earth from Pritchett, Colorado. <laughs> There's nothing there that anybody would want to go for. 144 people in the whole town. It was terrible. But you know what? I, at, I didn't have any desire. Matter of fact, the first time we ever drove through there, we were driving through with a friend of ours, a couple. And I started laughing and saying, Don, I think God's calling you to preach at Colorado. <laughs> I said, thus saith the Lord. And I started joking with him. And boy, it wasn't two months until I was living there. <laughs> and so that's what I thought of preach at Colorado. But you know, once God called me to go, I... I had some resistance, but the moment I got it settled that this is what God told me to do, well, then that's fine. And, you know, you go to a church of 10 people in a town of 144 people that is 30 miles from the next largest town of 1,000 people, there's no way to... That's not a stepping stone to anything. <laughs> the only way you leave a situation like that is feet first. But I knew that that's what God wanted me to do. And I fell in love with Pritchett, Colorado as soon as I knew that that's what God told me to do. And, and God put his desires in my heart. And I loved Pritchett. And I had a great time there. And I can truthfully say that, you know, there was... When I made that decision, I haven't struggled with the will of God. There's been a couple of times I've struggled to know, is this really you? But once I know that it's God's will, it, it's non-negotiable. And brothers and sisters, I deal with a lot of people. And most people aren't like that. And that's the reason that they struggle. And that's one of the reasons that God hasn't revealed His will to you. Because if He was to show you, all it would do is make you more accountable. And then if you fail to do it because you haven't submitted to Him yet, then you'd not only be out of the will, but now you'd be in rebellion because you said that you were going to be a living sacrifice. And so... This just solves a lot of problems. When you just re figure out that there's only one God and you aren't Him. And so He's God, you aren't, and you'll just do what He tells you to do. I've had people come up to me and say, I wouldn't serve a God that didn't heal, that didn't prosper you, and that wasn't a full gospel God and stuff. Well, I would. Praise God I don't have to. I found out that he's a good God and does this, but when I thought, when I was told that God's want to kill my dad, I, he was God, and if that's the way that God was, I'd serve him. I found out that he didn't do that. I found out God's a good God. But you know what? I'd serve God. I don't care whether it's to my advantage or not. And I'm saying this in love, but there are some of you here that haven't come to grips with this, and you know what? You are God in your life. You pick and choose what you will do. You know, I just uh, find it hard to relate to that. And praise God, I'm glad I do. But there are some of you that you know that the Word says that you're supposed to give. But you feel like you need this money and you aren't able to give. And so, if you don't think it's advantageous, if you think it's going to be a problem on you, well then you, you know what God's Word says, but this is what you're going to do. You aren't a living sacrifice. There are some of you that knows that God's called you to do something, but it's not convenient for you or it's going to cause something and you just choose to go your way. You aren't a living sacrifice. And that's God's will. That's the heart of God's will is for you to be a living sacrifice committed unto Him. And if you do that, here's what the Lord told me. 
before this experience I was telling you about, he said, if you become a living sacrifice and if you renew your mind, I'll talk about that in the morning. That's a very important part of this process. Then you would have to literally backslide on me. You would have to rebel at me to keep from seeing my good, acceptable, and perfect will of God coming to pass in your life. And I've proven it. Man, I made that commitment and I didn't have a clue what to do. I've never been to cemetery, I mean seminary, and I never learned all of these kind of things. But you know what? I've been submitted to God, and God took me through Vietnam, and God has taken me through things. I wouldn't encourage anybody to follow God the way I have. But you know what? God, despite all of my frailties and mistakes that I've made, I did some stupid stuff. When we first got married, I thought that if you were going to minister, you couldn't work. You were sinning against God. And so I refused to work. And we, we would go weeks without food when Jamie was eight months pregnant. There's not very many women that would have stayed with me through that. I was wrong, wrong, wrong. But I was willing to do whatever God told me to do. And I thought that, that I thought I was sinning against God if I worked a job. So the first year we were married, our total income was $1,253 with $100 a month rent. Figure that one out. The second year, our income jumped up to $2,500 because I was brain dead. But my heart was right. And you know what? Eventually we learned and God brought me through it. And I've done a lot of dumb things and I haven't done everything right. And yet God has just blessed us blessed us hand over fist. And I'm telling you, God's more concerned about your heart than He is your head and your talents and your abilities. God doesn't need a silver vessel. He's looking for a surrendered vessel. And I can guarantee you, if you commit your life to God and do whatever He says... God will promote you in whatever area He wants you to go and you will prosper and succeed. You will have the favor of God. Things will work for you better than they would ever work when you are the one that's driving and controlling this thing and calling all of the shots. Believe it or not, God is sharper than you. God knows more than you. God can do it better than you. You shouldn't lean under your own understanding. But you ought to submit your way unto God. And this is so hard for people to understand. But this is the beginning place. And most people, it's like a rung on a ladder. They want to get to the top of the ladder and see God use them and see this happen. But the first rung on that ladder is to become a living sacrifice. And if you skip that rung on the ladder, you aren't going to get very high. You can't get around this. Some people try and get around it, and that's the reason that we have people in ministry who didn't take the time to get character built and integrity and fame and popularity and influence corrupted them, and they thought that they were invincible, and they go out and wind up committing adultery and stealing money and stuff because they didn't wait on God to promote them. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. I'm telling you, this is why a lot of stuff happens. If you didn't have that, that inroad of Satan open, this selfishness, this is how Satan comes in your life, is through self-centeredness and promoting yourself. That's it. It says, don't put a novice in a position of authority. 1 Timothy chapter 3 don't put a novice in a position of authority lest he be lifted up with pride, fall into the condemnation of the devil. What was the condemnation of the devil? Isaiah chapter 14, the devil said, I will be like the Most High. I will ascend on the sides of the north. I will put my throne above the stars of heaven. I will be like God. Satan's sin was pride. He didn't hate God. He envied Him. And he wanted the glory and the honor that went to God. And he's tried to usurp it. This is why praise drives the devil mad. That's why he flees at praise because praise is just rubbing his nose in what he always wanted and never has been able to get. And he is an egomaniac. Everything is about him. He wants what God has. And when you start praising God, he just can't stand it. He flees. Praise is strength against the devil. Satan is the original selfish person. 
Satan is absolutely 100% self-centered and to the degree that we're self-centered, we're like the devil. And this is how Satan gains inroad into our life is through our own selfishness. If you thought more about other people than you did about yourself, you wouldn't be offended when other people neglect you. You'd rejoice when somebody else is promoted instead of thinking, why didn't I get that? How come they didn't recognize me? How come I got passed over for promotion? You know, we just had a board meeting with one of my board of directors. Paul Milligan is on my board of directors. And Paul got the baptism of the Holy Spirit in his living room listening to my radio programs like 30-something years ago. And he, was, he got a job working for a place. And he's a real entrepreneur. Now he's a multimillionaire and has, I don't know, 12 companies and 1,200 employees and all kinds of things. But back then, he was just working for another person, and he had all of this potential, and he came up with these ideas, and his boss stole the ideas and told him that it was his ideas, and his boss started getting raises and promotions. And when Paul found out about this, you know what he did? He had a choice. Was he going to get selfish and mad about, look what he's getting, and I'm not getting this? Paul decided, you know what? I am going to serve this guy. I'm going to do it heartily as unto the Lord. And, and, and not unto man. And he told his boss, he says, you can do whatever you want to with it. He says, I'm going to do the right thing and you, you're responsible to God. And he, this guy just stole his ideas and he started getting promotions, promotions, promotions. And Paul just stayed down here. Nobody was appreciating all of his ideas that were making the company money. You know what that is? That's a selfless attitude. That is a true servant's heart. And it wasn't very long, a year or so, until somehow, he didn't tell anybody, but somehow the, the powers that be found out what was really happening. I think that they promoted this guy to a level that they saw he was incompetent and these ideas couldn't have been coming from him. And they found out who had really been done in it, doing it, and Paul became this guy's boss and became the vice president of the company and not long after that left and started his own companies and God promoted him and he's a multi-millionaire and travels the world and does things because he was a faithful man and because he didn't get in and stab somebody in the back and promote himself. The scripture says, Vengeance is mine. Romans chapter 12, thus saith the Lord, I will repay. And yet most of us, because we are selfish, we won't trust God to advance us. We're going to advance ourselves. And if somebody doesn't treat us right, bless God, we're going to demand our rights. We're going to get in and make everybody realize who we are. That's not a living sacrifice. Now, there's a balance. This doesn't mean that you just lay down. If God tells you to do something, do it. But I'm saying you aren't motivated by selfish stuff. You are serving God and you are willing to let your life be used up and there's not very many people like that. And this is the first step in finding God's will is to become a living sacrifice. You know, this usually goes over about like this. <laughs> this is not one of those kind of messages that makes people shout and clap and interrupt me and things like this. People don't like this, but I'm telling you this for your own good, that this is what would jumpstart your spiritual life is for you to get off the throne and say, Jesus, I want you to control my life. And you become a sacrifice. And you just lay yourself down before God and say, God, whatever. And let me also say, I'm going to give an invitation and ask to pray for people here tonight. But you know what? There are many of you that just like me you can't make a U-turn at this moment. You got so much momentum built up. You are so selfish. You are absolutely selfish. It is all about you. You know what? If the Lord was to turn you around and make a U-turn, it'd be a wreck. He's going to have... It's going to take a while to turn you around and start moving you in the other direction. And so it's a process. There's some of you that maybe tonight you realize that this is the problem. But God, I'm not even willing to make that change today. But I'm willing to start being willing. I'm willing for you to start the change. And some of you might just have to head in that direction. And then once you make a commitment, you could make a commitment with all of your heart. And did you know that you're still going to have that self. 
You don't get delivered of it. Like I had people come up before and say, well, would you just cast this selfishness out of me? I can't do it. <laughs> Self is your personality. It's the, what most of us consider the real us. And you know what? The only way you can get delivered from this carnal self is to go be with Jesus. I could kill you, and that's the only way you would get delivered of self. You're going to have self even after you make a total commitment to the Lord, and you are going to spend the rest of your life learning how to follow through on the decision that you make, that I'm going to put Jesus first in my life. You know, Jim Irwin was one of the astronauts that walked on the moon, and I was in Vietnam when they did that, and I missed all of the moon walks. And so when I got out of there, I wanted to find out about this because we didn't get to see any of this stuff. I, it's just like I missed all of that stuff. And when I met Jim Irwin, we swapped books. And he signed my, his books, I signed my books, and we were on the television thing together, and I got to visiting with him, and I was just pumping him. I wanted to know all about these moonshots. and about, I just thought that the technology was so awesome that when they shot them up there, that, you know, they just landed on the exact spot, and I was very impressed with everything. As I got to talking to him, it wasn't like that at all. They blasted out off and threw that capsule towards the moon, and it was four days that they left Earth orbit to go to the moon, and he said every ten minutes for four days they had a course correction. And sometimes that capsule was going that direction when the moon was over here. Sometimes they were 90 degrees off, and they would have to have this huge burn to get back. And he said other times they were a fraction of an inch off. I didn't know that. I thought it was just perfect. He says, no, they just threw it towards the moon, and then they kept making these course corrections. So that cap capsule actually went like this towards the moon. And then I thought that they just landed on the exact spot that they had planned. He said they had a 500-mile long target area. And when he got out of the lunar module and stepped on the moon, he was within five feet of being outside that 500-mile area. <laughs> they nearly missed a 500-mile landing strip. But guess what? They made it. And when he was telling that to me, the Lord spoke to me, and he says, that's the way it is when you make a commitment of your life to the Lord. It's not like I just commit, and you're never going to have a mistake, and you're never going to mess up. You make a total commitment, and within five or ten minutes, you're going to have an opportunity for a course correction. <laughs> Somebody's going to go out here and grab the last tape that you wanted, and are you going to be selfish and say, no, let me have it, or are you going to say, God bless you, I'll wait and get it later. You're going to start to pull out of the parking lot, and are you going to just speed up so that that person can't get in front of you, or are you going to let a person come in front of you? I can guarantee you, you'll have a course correction every 10 minutes for the rest of your life. This is why this scripture says, present your body as a living sacrifice. You know what's wrong with a living sacrifice? It keeps crawling off the altar. <laughs> you got to bind it to the altar. You got you to say, Father, I make a total commitment. And then don't be surprised if tomorrow you wake up and you just start again thinking about, man, what about me? What about mine? And all of a sudden you catch yourself. The Holy Spirit brings it back to your remembrance. That doesn't mean that you weren't committed to God. It doesn't mean that you didn't make it. It just meant that, you know what, you still got that flesh and it's going to have to be subdued and you deny it and you reject it and you say, you know what, I am not going to live the way I've lived. I'm putting Jesus first in my life and you'll make course corrections the rest of your life. You know, a real embarrassing situation for me that I don't get any joy out of this, but... I was at Bob Tilton's church back when Bob Tilton was really on fire and doing some good things, and I was at his church, and I had been on his television program, and I had met him, but it was years before, and I was only on radio, and nobody knew what I looked like, and I was among, I don't know, 5,000 people or whatever it was, and I was sitting there thinking about, I wonder if anybody knows who I am. I bet you I minister to all kinds of people. I'd been on te radio for 20 years. I wonder if anybody knows who I am. They don't know what I look like. And I was just, it was selfish. It was absolutely selfish. It was just thinking about, does anybody know how important I am? <laughs> and right as I was thinking that, 
Bob Tilton stood up and says, Oh, we're so blessed to have Andrew Womack in the audience today. Stand up. And I felt like, oh, God, it's just like he knew that this self was rising up. And he had me stand up in front of all. I was just sure all of them could see how absolutely selfish and hypocritical I was. But you know what? I wasn't aware. I, it wasn't something I did consciously. You just have this selfishness in you. And as soon as I saw it, and God had me stand up and put a spotlight on me. <laughs> I spent the rest of the day saying, God, I'm sorry because that's not what I wanted. That's not the way I want to be. And so I'm saying all of these things to encourage you that when you say that you're going to deal with yourself and you're going to die to yourself, that doesn't mean that you're perfect and that you never make a mistake. As long as you're breathing, there's going to be an opportunity for you to put yourself ahead of other people and advance your interest at the expense of other people. But you can reach a place where you make a total commitment and as soon as you realize what you're doing, man, that is not the choice that you want. That is not the way that you want your life to go. And you turn from that. And you just get back on, on the path. This doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. I heard a man one time teach something similar about how he had crucified the flesh 20 years ago and he's never had a flesh flash since then. <laughs> and the moment he said that, I wrote Ichabod over his head. The glory has departed. I said, this guy is not of God. I said, that's not true. As long as you have a flesh, you're going to have to deal with it. As long as you're breathing, you got a self. But you can reach a place to where you make this commitment and it starts the ball rolling. And in my own personal life, this is what happened to me, March the 23rd, 1968. God brought me to the end of myself. I realized that it wasn't other people that was my problem. It was me. I repented of that, I asked the Lord forgiveness and I just said, God, I'll do anything. And I realized that I couldn't do it, that it had to be God. And I guarantee you, my life has been absolutely supernatural. I could give you thousands of examples. But this is, you will, you will experience the beginning of God when you come to the end of yourself and not until. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that you can't encounter God every once in a while. It doesn't mean that God can't touch you because He loves you and He'll move in your life as much as you can. But you aren't going to see the supernatural, miraculous power of God consistently working in your life until you quit telling Him how to run your life and you come to the end of yourself and put God first. And sad to say, most of us haven't done that. When you came out of the womb... It was total self-centeredness. And now we're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60-year-old adult brats that still think it's all about us. You know how many people it takes to change a light bulb? With most of us, it's just one because you hold it and the world revolves around you. <laughs> but I'm telling you that that's not the way that God made you to be. You need to humble yourself and make yourself a living sacrifice. That's not all that there is, but there's not anything that you can do until you do that. That is an absolute first step.